So hello everyone, good morning. Welcome to Evaluating Your Memory Lab. This is the seventh webinar in a series of eight intended to help build and strengthen a network of memory labs in California. Many thanks to the California State Library for supporting this series and for establishing a new copycat grant program this year. Very exciting to build and support memory labs in the state. My name is Pamela Vatican. I'm director of California Revealed, which is a California State Library initiative that helps public libraries and other local heritage groups digitize, preserve, and make available um, online collections related to the state's history and culture. And our very special guest today is Linda Stewart, who is a project advisor for Pacific Library Partnership on many LSTA grant-funded projects. And she's also a grant monitor for this um, very specific copycat grant program. Um, so some of you may already know her. Welcome, Linda. Do you mind introducing yourself? Uh, no problem. Um, so um, I'm Linda Stewart. I've been a project advisor um, for the State Library for, gosh, I guess close to a decade now. And I've worked on a variety of um, grant projects, memory lab, really appealed to me and I was so excited when I saw that um, Pamela and the State Library were offering this to libraries because I've been involved in digitization for the last couple of decades. Um, the other hat that I wear is that um, I'm an adjunct librarian and archivist at Pasadena City College and there I teach a year long certificate program on digitization for cultural heritage institutions. And so I've been involved in these kinds of activities for years. And like I said, I was just thrilled when I heard that, that Memory Lab, um, that California State Library was gonna be supporting Memory Lab development here. So um, yeah, I'm ex really excited to be part of this program. <laughs> Wonderful. Glad to have you. So this is just an overview of the series, um, just to remind you where we are right now. Um, the next webinar will be in a couple of weeks in August around sustaining and expanding um, your memory lab, um, building off of some of the topics we'll talk about today. Um, but I did want to point out that this training and we are hoping to do this in person next year is we really do want this to be um, in person ideally. Um, so a lot of this curriculum is based, most of this curriculum is based on the Memory Lab Network's um, curriculum that's available at memorylabnetwork.github.io. Um, some of this could be in person, but we're doing our best um, during this time of remote learning um, to connect with you all. And, and I really do hope that as the series concludes um, to touch base with, especially the copycat grantee cohort, just to let, just to get an idea of how useful this was, if there's anything else that we could have touched upon um, to help with your planning and building. Um, I'm looking forward to evaluating ourselves too, <laughs> um, as we talk about evaluation today. Um, so yeah, I just, I definitely wanted to, um, acknowledge all of the work of Siobhan Hagen, who's the project manager of the Memory Lab Network, and, and what a great resource the deep dive is. So we're just um, talk, you know, kind of giving an overview, but there's a lot more information out there, obviously. And um, yeah, I hope to keep the conversation going. I would really love this meeting to be more of a discussion if possible. Um, I don't mean to put you all on the spot, um, but if you all don't mind, um, introducing yourselves and letting us know kind of where you are in your planning and building. I know it's at the end. So um, yeah, if you all could let us know how it's going, that'd be really helpful for us. And if you don't mind, um, you could just say in the chat if, if you don't want to speak up, that's fine too. Maybe Constance 
once could we have Constance lead off if you're interested in doing this just simply because we know your mic works. <laughs> sure, I was just beginning to type. Um, <laughs> um, we are in the process of setting up our memory lab. Um, we have things on order. A lot of things are back ordered due to COVID. And so, you know, computers haven't arrived. Um, furniture hasn't arrived, but um, we are working towards getting it set up. Today, we have our first kind of initial kickoff program today and tomorrow where we're going to do scanning. Um, we've decided to set up a um, walk in. People can come and scan um, their vital documents um, and we'll put them on a flash drive for them. So it kind of introduces them to the fact that we have this new scanner um, and uh, and that this la the lab is going to be set up hopefully by September <laughs> as we wait as we wait for everything to arrive. Uh, so yeah, we're at the very initial phases um, and just kind of beginning to kick it off and kind of work through everything we need to do. Yeah. That's wonderful. I'm excited for your event. Yes, hopefully we have a good turnout. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun to you know practice with the um it gives us a good time to practice with the with the scanner and then as we start getting you know everything's arriving slowly so we have boxes piled up but uh but we're not quite ready to get get it set it loose <laughs> yeah that's understandable <laughs> how about you kimberly are you able to um maybe type how how things are going for you and where you are in your planning of your memory lab. Can, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you a little bit. Okay. Let me, this, this headset's a little bit weird. Sorry about that. That's okay. I can hear you. Can others hear you? Barely. <laughs> um, um, I'll, I'll try to speak as loud as I can. Uh, let me see if this is Does that help a little bit? Is the volume a little bit higher? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay. Um, if anything, I'll I'll also type it into the uh, into the chat as well. Um, so from it's been kind of a whirlwind of a month, uh, getting everything all set up for our, our memory lab. So we have all of our equipment set up. Um, We've got uh, something similar to LAPL. So we have like our scanner, um, our VHS decks, um, our audio cassette decks, uh, the iMac, the DV, it, it pretty much almost everything that um, that's very similar to uh, LAPL. Um, and then we're just pretty much right now in the testing phases and having um, staff uh, practice. Um, with all of the equipment and making sure that everything is running fine. Uh, we ran into a few like hiccups with um, some of our workflows. So uh, our start date or rather live date for the public to use is hopefully August 19th. Um, that's apparently going to be a very big opening for our permanent lab um, as uh, well as our 100th year anniversary as a system. So it's kind of kicking all of that off at the same time. Um, so it, it's a rush trying to get um, the staff currently at the permanent lab uh, set up and, and trained. And then um, from there, we'll just figure out uh, like our members. I know Melanie was a part of, is a part of the team um, <laughs> kind of, I was like, oh no, she, she must be having some uh, internet connection, connectivity issues. Um, but uh, yeah, we're just um, kind of excited and also very um, nervous at the same time, just hoping that everything kind of runs smoothly because since we did run into those hiccups. Yeah, no, that that's, sounds great. I mean, I'm impressed that both of you are planning to open in some capacity fairly soon. So that's wonderful to hear. And good to know Melanie is part of your team then, Kimberly. Yeah. 
part of the OC Public Libraries team. There's like, there's several of you, I know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you both for sharing. It's really helpful for Linda and I as we launch into our presentation. I mean, I think, you know, we, we do want to acknowledge that I know a lot of this year has been um, about planning and it's not about, you know, opening the doors quite yet um, and having everything, you know, happen simultaneously as this like smooth, smoothly running machine. Like we don't expect that at all. So it's, it is helpful to hear where you are and, um, and acknowledge that we are in troubleshooting mode. <laughs> <laughs> and that's totally fine. Um, beyond the webinar, um, we're, we've also been doing these brown bags. They're very informal get togethers and they've actually just been really, really small groups for the most part. Um, so I do encourage you all to come. Uh, this. The next one's gonna be right at the end of the grant period. So maybe it'll be a little bit of a, a party and we can hear about um, your events. That would be great um, if you all um, are free to come. And um, I need to send out reminders, which I think is why people aren't showing up. So I'll, I'll be sure to send a reminder out um, next month for that. Um, but yeah, it really is a time for us to have kind of more informal gatherings and troubleshoot together, um, you know, and make connections since we're all kind of doing the same thing together at this, relatively at the same time. So what, what are the purposes, um, what's the purpose of evaluation? Um, really it's, you know, you wanna have an evaluation strategy at the same time of planning. So how, how, do you, how are you gonna know that your memory lab's a success? So I, you know, we will talk about um, quantitative and qualitative data in a moment um, and what, what that can look like, but you really do want to consider benchmarks um, so that you can kind of check in as your project's developing, um, check in throughout the process um, so you can have moments of reflection. So it's not this sort of like uh, rush at the end to, uh, Kind of take your medicine and and report your deliverables like all nice and neat like i think really evalu evaluation is like a constant process it's iterative um the goal is to provide the best service possible um and to just kind of keep thinking about this at every level of your program so at the beginning from community assessment to information gathering and then um, you know determining your outcomes to um, develop your programs and services so um really want this to be kind of a constant process and not just this like thing that you have to do. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's supposed to be um, an a opportunity, opportunity to um, learn from, you know, the successes and learn from the challenges too. Um, and really think about um, how you can improve your service, um, not only is your you know, memory lab connecting with the community? Is it responding to the need to community needs? Um, and it will help you kind of plan for the future. So there's always this constant uh, modification. Uh, maybe you want to introduce new programs, uh, maybe new, serv uh, new services like new formats. Um, this will help you kind of inform your priorities because we know we can't do everything, we can't serve. Um, every single need. So what are the essential needs of your community and kind of adapting from there. Okay, so I want to talk to you this morning um, a little more in depth about the evaluation, uh, the expectations for a copycat grant, which of course um, all of you um, are using to, to fund your projects. Um, if you'll remember back to, for those of you that saw the, <laughs> the application, the original application, um, you may have noticed in that that, um, and if you were completing this, you of course had to make some decisions about um, 
the overall outcome for um, your grant. And that process in the last few years has really become more standardized. Um, and so now for project outcomes, you're asked to choose from a list of, I think they're what, five or six different kind of predetermined goals. And then you were advised that the measurement of those outcomes would be assessed through survey instruments that the state library would provide for you. The results of those surveys then are submitted electronically and then the staff at the state library tabulate all that data. And then finally, at the close of the grant, the library is provided with the results of those surveys. Um, the surveys are administered at any time that the program or that the project involves giving programs, presentations. So some of the things that we're go seeing going on um, this today, <laughs> um, if you're doing consultation with patrons, um, if also if you're doing acquisition or creation of content, and then finally, if you're doing planning or evaluation activities, surveys are required, um, again, for these kinds of activities as part of your grant. And again, this all gets reported in the final narrative, and we'll, we'll take a look at how that happens. Um, Pamela, you want to go ahead and advance it? So as you can see from these questions, so things like, I learned something by participating in this library activity, or I intend to imply, I intend to apply what I just learned, or I'm more aware of resources and services um, provided by the library. They're really designed to assess whether or not you've met kind of the overarching outcome goals that you identified in your grant application. Remember, there's there's only like six of these. So examples of these would have been goal three is something like California um, innovates through their libraries. And I think Alameda may have chosen that one. Um, there's also goal four, which um, has to do with technology. So California's, Californians view libraries as relevant technology hubs for accessing information and services. Um, so these are the kinds of questions, these are exact questions, actually, exact. These are the questions that get um, put to patrons after they've, say, completed um, a training that you've given or attended a presentation. But um, in addition to these questions, you can ask three, um, three additional questions. And so if you want to drill down again and be more specific um, about the information needs of your library in terms of what your patrons want, you can use these surveys to do that through those three questions. But I would put to you today that you're really gonna need more data in order to evaluate your program and your patrons' needs. Um, and so we'll talk about some other ways that you can gather, collect that information. Pamela, you wanna go ahead and advance it? So in the copycat toolkit on the State Library's website, right? There was an outcome that um, the authors for this uh, Memory Lab grant had identified. And if you look at the outcomes here, you can see that these goals are really very um, kind of operational. And the data that you'll collect in those standardized surveys that we just looked at, they're likely not going to provide you with enough um, and specific enough data to really assess whether things like the workflows that were developed are proving useful or if the equipment that was purchased is really meeting the needs of your patrons. Um, instead, you're probably going to want to ask questions like, what equipment did you use today? How many scans did you create? What was your experience like using the memory lab? What works well? What could have been improved? You know, have you taken advantage of the training that we're offering? Or 
perhaps questions that get to uh, real outcomes. So how's the preservation of your family history? How's the preservation of your family history materials? How's that impacted you and or your family? This kind of data is helpful um, in not only assessing your current practices, so things like, you know, survey data shows that 90 minutes is an, accept, an acceptable time frame for patrons to um, spend on the scanner. Um, <coughs> you may also, um, through these kinds of surveys, again, learn what is working and also what isn't necessarily working for your users. So you might find out that um, patrons aren't really able to scan everything that they thought they were going to be able to scan when they came in because they're bringing in oversized materials. And by oversized materials, I don't mean they're bringing in, you know, huge maps, but they may be bringing in, you know, 11 by 14 prints that they had in frames or eight by tens that need to be um, landscape rather than portrait on the scanner. So you're finding that that um, you know, 11 by 12 um, glass surface on the scanner isn't quite big enough. Instead, you need, you know, an 11 by 17. Well, if you can document the, the usage again and these kinds of um, comments from users, that can really help you build your justification for funding, um, both internally and when you're applying, say, for perhaps additional grants or money from, say, your friends group or your library foundation. Um, one of the challenges with digitization projects of all kinds, whether we're talking about video, uh, whether we're talking about audio, scanning photographs, that kind of thing, is that this really is not a program where you buy equipment once and you're done. Um, the half-life of say an Epson photo scanner is about 18 months, which means that especially for equipment with high usage or even more so if you're doing a mobile lab where that equipment is being moved around quite a bit, the need to replace equipment is pretty routine. Um, and so for these kinds of reasons, the data that shows how much that equipment is being used, how many scans are being produced, how many patrons are using the equipment, the type of materials they're scanning, this is going to be really valuable data, not only for planning and going forward, but for resourcing. Um, so it can be really helpful in making requests for additional um, funds for your program. Um, one other thing that I want to mention here, and I, this to me is really, really important. I can't stress enough how important it is. And that really is to document um, the outcomes for your patrons of these kinds of projects. And when I say that, that last question that I suggested to you, so how has the digitization of your family heirlooms, how's it impacted you? How's it impacted your family? If you can capture that data, either in a survey, if you have comments from patrons, um, video, if you can uh, capture some video of patrons at the end of their sessions or maybe meet with them individually to talk about these kinds of impacts, it's this kind of data that really captures the interest of potential funders. Um, so I would really encourage you um, to try to capture as much of that as you can. Next slide. So where are we right now? <laughs> well, we've heard already some success stories this morning. Orange County's um, sounds like you're, you've managed wonderfully in getting um, your equipment um, sourced and in the libraries and getting it set up. Um, for others, we're hearing um, not only for Memory Lab um, grants, but for grants across the board, is that you're experiencing delays right now in sourcing and being able to, to work face-to-face -face with patrons. Um, and these kinds of challenges are impacting the planned activities that you had 
and to, of course, meet those goals that you've identified in your grant. And of course, right now, we're, we're one month out from the end. So the copycat grants end August 31st. Um, the data collection through those standardized surveys is, of course, overall across the board, it's down. Um, and for the Memory Lab project specifically, although um, some libraries envisioned um, building and launching their labs, as well as getting staff and patrons trained in this first year, as Pamela mentioned, we really thought that developing and sourcing that lab, getting it set up would likely take most of what, what eight months you had um, for this grant cycle. So this is really what we kind of figured that you would be spending your time on, although some of you were really ambitious in your planning. Um, and that's great, that's great. We don't wanna discourage that, but we recognize that there, there really have been some limitations this year in terms of what you could actually accomplish. And so while there's a lot of learning going on, um, Again, we didn't expect to see much in the way of survey data from library patrons. Okay, so then what, what are you gonna do? Because now you're a month out and the following month in September, you're gonna be putting together your final narratives about what you have, um, what you have accomplished over this last year. Next slide. Thanks. So um, we would encourage you to really talk about the successes that you have had during this grant cycle. Um, and if you look at this list, I, I have to um, <laughs> um, I have to credit Pamela for putting this slide together. And I looked at it and thought, oh, this is great. And initially, we she had kind of labeled it as deliverables for um, this grant cycle. And while we don't don't want to um, we don't want to frighten you or intimidate you in any way, this really is a great list of the types of successes that we hope that you would have this year. So <laughs> establishing a list of the equipment that you have. So starting that inventory is critical. You need to, to document all of that. Um, establishing um, or setting up the call for donations equipment. So identifying potential vendors for that equipment. Um, that's also one of the reasons why these meetings are so important, the training as well as follow-up meetings, because as if you all, as many of you have learned, um, being able to actually uh, get hold of some of this equipment is incredibly difficult. And when you're, um, when you're managing a grant, when you're uh, planning a new program, one of the things that is so important is that you're always uh, planning for change, managing for change. And so as much documentation as you cre can create for the program with respect to where did we get that piece of equipment and where might we go to next and where have other libraries been able to um, get hold of this kind of equipment, um, documenting all of that, putting that in um, notes for those who may come um, after you when you, you know, move on to your next promotion or whatever. Um, this kind of information is really, really helpful. Um, establishing your policies and your workflows. So again, documenting. Um, we usually in libraries policies, we know we have to document our policies because they come up in conversations during patrons. But for this type of activity, it's really important that you also document your workflows. Um, establishing um, user agreements, really um, all kinds of agreements that apply to this program. So user agreements, agreements with um, other partners that you may have for the program, getting all of those in writing <laughs> and um, agreed to. Again, another really important win um, for your the first year of your grant. Um, some of you have already started testing your equipment with sample items 
that um, getting for the staff to get comfortable using the equipment. Now, for some of you, you have staff that are experienced with digitization and this isn't a major hurdle for you, but for others, it can be a big hurdle. And especially since we're talking about a variety of equipment here, we're not just talking about a flatbed scanner. Um, again, making sure that we have staff that are trained on using that equipment, testing it out, um, developing those workflows and documenting all of that is really important. Training staff goes without saying, right? Um, deciding on a mechanism for surveying and collecting feedback from staff and patrons. So I've already talked about the standardized surveys that you're um, being asked to use during uh, your copycat grant, but as Pamela mentioned, surveying and collecting feedback from your patrons as well as staff is going to be important throughout the life of this program, not just during your first year. So think about um, how it is that you might collect that kind of data. Again, what's most popular, of course, and typically used are things like, you know, the written surveys, the, you know, check the box kind of thing. Online surveys with COVID, those became particularly important this year. And my guess is we'll continue to use those. So maybe at the end of a session on the scan or a pop-up um, survey can be developed where they can quickly um, fill that out to provide you with that kinds of data. Again, I think um, oral interviews, if you can get some recorded interviews with patrons and with staff, about what it was like to work on that program for staff and for um, patrons. So what is it like using that equipment and what, um, what suggestions might they make for going forward to make this program even better for patrons and then those outcomes um, for them personally. So how is this impacting your life? Um, how is it impacting um, your families? Those kinds of things. <coughs> We didn't talk a lot about publicity this year because, of course, you're, you're building, most of you are building your labs this year, and so there hasn't been a big, big emphasis on publicity materials. But in the next couple of months, um, if you haven't done so already, you may want to start to develop an outreach plan. So how are we going to um, make our public aware of the programs that we have available, both in terms of the equipment that we have and the types of training? This, of course, um, will be ongoing. It'll be you know, changing over time. But if you can get that knocked out, <laughs> at least a preliminary plan um, by the end of this grant cycle, you'll be, um, you'll be ahead of the game. There's likely going to be other kinds of successes that you will have experienced um, this year. And again, um, those are going to be critically important when you complete your final narrative. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, but I think what um, one of the things that we really want to stress here is documentation of all of that is really critical. And I know that when um, you're in the middle of, you know, basically receiving boxes and getting equipment set up and trying to decide, you know, when you're going to offer your first training, um, it's, it's easy to lose sight of the documentation. And so I would really encourage you to kind of focus in um, as you get to the end of the grant cycle and make sure that you have um, some of this or a lot of this um, documented. It sometimes helps to make one person in charge of the documentation kind of monitoring that to make sure that it happens. But these are the kinds of wins, the kinds of successes that we really expected you would see during this grant cycle. Not necessarily that we had, you know, 75 people show up for a day of scanning. Um, that really, you know, for those of you that are able to make your labs um, open and available to patrons in these last, you know, two months or so, um, that's great. But we know that for many of you, that just is, wasn't possible. Uh, next slide.
Okay, so let's um, let's talk a little bit now about um, your final reporting. So if you do have survey data, this information gets entered into your final narrative when you report on specific grant activities. Um, so let's say that you've done um, a series of online presentations teaching patrons how to use the equipment in the lab. Because this is a presentation uh, for the public, you um, should have surveyed them using the state library surveys. As soon as you choose presentation as your activity, the system will direct you basically to an area where you, were, where you will enter that survey data. Um, the same would be true if you were um, doing training for staff. Surveys, again, they just like um, for patrons, if you, if you did training for staff, those surveys should have been completed and they'll get entered into the system. But what about all of the, the successes, the wins, the activities, the outputs where you don't have survey data? Well, at the end of the narrative form, and this is, you complete this online, um, but there, um, you will get a draft of this up front. <laughs> um, and so you'll be able to uh, spend some time entering data into basically a Word document so that you can kind of polish this before you enter it into the electronic system. But as you get to the end of uh, that reporting, there is a um, place for you to enter additional evaluation um, and assessment material. So what I would encourage you to do is go back to your original application and address the successes that you've had or the issues that you've had with each one of these. Um, so in most cases, when I look at grant applications, applications, generally you'll find listed between eight and 10 different activities. Um, and there will, <coughs> you'll also have a list of outputs. So we anticipated that we would be creating, you know, X number of um, um, a user manual, or we're going to create um, five different publicity materials. So again, outputs. So things that you're going to, to generate, or, you know, we're going to have 20 people attend four different trainings. Um, so go back to those outputs that you identified in your grant application and the activities that you um, listed in your grant application and address each one of these in the um, that the final, it's on the final page of the evaluation form. Go in and really assess those. There's two reasons for doing this. Yes, the library wants to know, or the state library wants to know about the successes that you've had, the wins that you've had, and also what you've learned, what didn't go, what didn't go as planned. Um, and of course, a lot, we recognize that a lot of that this year is going to be because of COVID, but there could be other um, reasons for why things didn't happen quite as you thought they were. The State Library wants that information. They want to know that, um, in part because it helps them counsel other libraries that embark on, on similar kinds of projects. But the other thing is, IMLS, who provides the funding to the State Library, which then gets refunded through these, um, in this case, um, these Memory Lab grants, they want to know what, what is working and what isn't working, because they too are providing advice and guidance to uh, not only state libraries, but to, li to individual libraries as to um, how to plan for these kinds of programs. And then most importantly, of course, that data is important for you because it helps you and your library evaluate um, what went wrong, what went right, um, how might we do this differently? It's, it, again, I think the most the most important reason to do this is because of the information that it provides you. 
So let's say that your application had um, as one of your outputs, you were going to assemble one memory lab with 15 pieces of equipment or that, you know, you would be holding 20 hours per week of drop in support for the memory lab and those things didn't quite happen. That's okay. It really is. Um, but just explain why you think it didn't happen and what you learned from that. Um, and if you can, if there are remedies that you can use at um, once the grant has ended in order to ensure that you really did, you were able to meet those, but it just isn't going to happen during the grant cycle, then go ahead and, and include that information. Um, lastly, I want to encourage you to include in your final narrative comments from patrons, photos, anything that helps to document um, the project in general, and of course, the successes, the wins in the project. So things like best training ever, uh, can hardly wait for the memory lab to open, or down the road, you know, photographs of patrons um, working with the equipment that is now available. These are much appreciated, again, um, by the State Library and ultimately by IMLS. Next slide. Linda, I wanted, um, can we just- Pamela, I don't remember. Were you gonna jump? Oh, I was gonna say, um, if we could just linger a little bit on this last slide about final grant yeah. reporting, because a question came in from Constance um, asking about just the, the reality of opening to the public. And, and Constance, you're welcome to, to chime in here with your question, but, um, but the, the question is, um, my understanding is that we were required to have the program regardless of the delays. And I think the idea, well, this is a big challenge of this particular grant because it, the memory lab is obviously an in-person <laughs> setup. Um, and, um, you know, ideally you'll have staff there to run the lab um, and, and the training, like this, this, this webinar series, like all of this really should be in person, um, just so everyone feels more supported. And I, this was a really big challenge when I was asked to put together the toolkit because the reality is that because of COVID, we're not allowed to be together. Um, and so I pointed um, Constance to the original copycat tool, Cupcat grant toolkit that kind of has like a lot, it's peppered with all these disclaimers, like basically do what you can do, um, but you have to meet state and local health, you know, requirements. And, um, you know, there's guidance for reopening that the state library provides. So um, it's this year, I want to say, or maybe, and it might even be true for next year too, is that this is, this is a weird time and there's only so much you can do. Um, and so I think that's why it is crucial to have this like evaluation, this like this kind of evaluation where you do talk about like the challenges, um, maybe even emphasize them more than the successes because <laughs> that's what we all we all want to learn from this. And if if we can, like, I mean, I would be happy to tweak the toolkit so that it is more realistic and more, um, you know possible like within a year because I think it is really tricky that this is a one-year grant so um, I appreciate you asking that question Constance and just wanting to clarify because I think yes ideally and at the end of all of these implementation steps the lab is ready um, for the public that was that was an outcome that was expected when we put this toolkit together but that was totally assuming that you know we would be in a place where we could all be together and libraries are open um, you know this was all developed um, over a year ago so that we've learned a lot <laughs> this year what what's actually really possible so um, yeah I don't know if you wanted to add anything else Linda to that but yeah well in our our program today and tomorrow is based on the fact that we needed to come up with a program to meet the, the requirements and we were limited in what we could do. 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, and, it, and it's going to work out. The other question I had is that, uh, um, and I didn't have anything to do with getting the grant or th this kind of part of it. Um, so I'm hoping I'm not speaking wrong, but um, my understanding is that we have put in for also the surveys and haven't received the surveys from the state library yet in order to fill them out in order to, while we're doing this program. Um, and I'm not quite sure what we're supposed to do about that, <laughs> uh, but it's hard to do it if we don't have them to, to do. Yeah, Constance, I, I, can, um, I can address that. Um, so the library early on submitted survey requests, which was great. I was so pleased when they came in. Um, the problem was in order for our assessment team to set those up, they need to know the dates of when they're being held um, because they set up uh, basically an electronic um, site for that data to be entered for each session. And so they needed a way to identify those. And that just didn't get back to us. Um, but there was a workaround that I think got created yesterday. Okay, good. Oh, good. Okay. See, I and was refined in. last night at 10 o'clock. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, you'll, you have them this morning. So. Okay. Fantastic. I, and I, like I said, I wasn't part of that. I don't know exactly sure. where it <laughs> went. We've been all, it's been a very tricky time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As you said, I'm trying to get everybody in the, you know, we've been in open, but um, at very limited staff and not everybody works together anymore. So um, it's, it's been tricky to try to keep track of everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, thank you. Yeah. And then Kimberly also mentioned that she, they have a staff um, survey that she put the link up for. Thank you so much, Kimberly, for sharing that. And Kimberly, um, was this was this one of the state surveys that the, that you posted? I'm sorry, I haven't looked at it. Um, or was this something you developed on your own? Um, I, from what I'm looking at it, I, I wasn't the one who uh, created the survey link. Um, I'm kind of more assisting on uh, the workflows and the processes and not on the grant itself. Uh, but I believe it's the, uh, the state survey that we okay. are utilizing. Um, a, a lot of it is um, we're trying to push it to virtual, so uh, and we're pushing it for staff first, since um, the public hasn't used it uh, yet. Um, but I don't know where the results of their survey are going to. Those are for <laughs> those who are in charge of the grant right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, it's a Go ahead. <laughs> I was just, I'm looking at the survey and it looks like there, you have two presentations available for staff to watch. There's a training video and an intro to digital literacy, which is great that you were able to set those up remotely. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah um, it, it was a combination of a couple of people who uh, did voiceovers and then we luckily had somebody who had um, video editing experience and so, uh, she put together um, all of that and we just followed a script. So, uh, it, yeah, <laughs> um, we, we're also, um, I believe we are skipping the orientation process. So the um, actual like orientation is the training videos themselves mm -hmm. um, that we're requesting for. I'm assuming that when the public gets to be able to use it, that they would have to view that first. Um, before they can even start utilizing any of the equipment in the lab. Mm -hmm. So the, the training video may be adapted for patrons. Yes. Yeah, that's great. I wonder if, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but would you, if someone from OCU Public Libraries would be willing to share those videos or if they are on YouTube, I guess maybe they're not on YouTube, but if they are shareable, I think others would learn a lot from just kind of how you're doing this in a remote situation. Yeah, I believe um, they are actually live on our website. Let me just copy and paste the link here. Thank you for sharing. No problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yay, look at you, you have a website for the Memory <laughs> Lab. 
<laughs> yeah, we were excited too. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, if you scroll down, I believe, towards like the first fourth of that page, and that's where our training videos are going to be. Wonderful. Um, the website itself is still kind of like uh, working around. We're trying to get everything a little bit more collapsed and a little bit neater, but that's that's what it looks like right now. It looks great. Nice thank job. You. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing, because it, it, it's just very useful to see what can be done in a remote weird year. So, yes. <laughs> you know, I think we can all learn, you know, from this and, um, and likewise to Constance, when you do your event, like, please, if you don't mind sharing how it goes, it'd be great to hear. Okay, I'm going to um, talk about collecting data unless you all have any other questions or comments. So this is um, building on the Memory Lab Network's curriculum, um, their deep dive. There's a really wonderful um, webinar that they have specifically about collecting and visualizing data, which I'll, I'll you'll see the link in a little bit. Um, but I, the, the idea, of course, is that um, you know collecting data is helpful, of course, not just for reporting, um, but you can see trends and patterns over time. Um, there's you know so much work goes into building the lab, and then there's even more work in collecting kind of the, the data. Um, I mean, why why do we do this? We want to learn from the experience, and the hard data is like is tangible. Um, we can see what what works and what doesn't, and um, and it's also a, a tool for as Linda's spoken about just building support um, for you know staffing or funding. Um, reports reports can justify the funding and then lay the foundation for future proposals. So this is really this is just the beginning and it's particularly crucial at this during this first year where you're you're planning a lot of planning, a lot of building and kind of justifying um, you know, the impact of um, and usefulness of your lab. So even if you haven't built your lab yet, it's important to consider evaluation, start collecting data um, early on in the process so that you can you know, be sure that um, you're utilizing your your resources, um, and you are trying to you know reach your goals most effectively. And and visualizing data is is an an amazing tool. So um, I would encourage you all to start collecting data um, electronically. Like, to, I mean, maybe this it depends. I know on your user group, but hopefully people will respond to an online form, um, you know, either after they finish the lab or, um, you know, as, as they finish the training um, to report back on, um, yeah, what, what the impact was for them. And the nice thing about like electronic data is, you know, it's easy to store and compare um, over time. And then of course, visualize and then share those vi visualizations um, with your stakeholders to really kind of build the case um, for, for your lab. And this is just an example of, you know, just using like a Google form, which then becomes data in a spreadsheet that you can input into this free software called Google Data Studio, which is a free data visualization program. Um, and I'll, I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit, but this is just for example, um, it's fairly easy to collect the data um, electronically thanks to these tools that are free. So there's different kinds of data. We've talked about uh, mostly quantitative data um, stats, right? So physical lab usage, um, how many folks are coming, um, number of appointments over time, maybe seeing like what are the most popular days and times or the least popular days and times to justify your your schedule and the need for staffing. Um, knowing what the most popular formats are can also um, help you with your planning. And you know you might need to invest in multiple VHS decks um, and not just rely on one, knowing that it, it's in use, it's in demand. Um, maybe people are requesting formats that you can't accommodate. So having that kind of data is really 
important so you can start finding that equipment and fundraising um, for those particular formats. Um, you also want to try to collect data around um, the use of your online resources, um, such as just using Google Analytics so that they can, you can then kind of document like who's coming to your site, um, what are the most popular pages, how long are they staying. Um, this will kind of, again, tune you into your community needs and, and get a sense of um, the, the impact of, of your services and and all that kind of information kind of beyond the physical lab, um, you definitely want to be reassured that people um, kind of understand the workflows, the process, and and hopefully are, they're taking care of their files in the end too, because that's that's a big part of the, the memory lab is people are walking away with their files and you want to be sure they're preserving them. And last but not least, which again is more kind of um, in a post-COVID world um, is, is having more programs like classes and events um, through the memory lab. And a good way of tracking that kind of uh, attendance is through like a Google form, you know, registration, and then of course uh, a roll call at the actual events or just having kind of that feedback loop of um, interest and, and people actually showing up and participating. So um, that's, basically these these are like the three parts of a memory lab in, in theory like I think a lot of the copycat grant is is focused on the physical lab um, but there's these other components to to um, respond to your community needs as well kind of beyond beyond the lab this is an example of Kind of what your data can look like. This is um, coming out of the DC Public Library's memory lab. And again, this is the link to that really great webinar that kind of goes through these kind of step-by-step -step, um, ways of collecting and then visualizing. There's all sorts of tools out there for visualizing metadata um, data, but they they speak to the Google Data Studio um, software specifically. That's what they use. And they have templates available that you can use. Um, so I just wanted you all to know that so you can grab it and use it because it's already ready to go. And the wonderful thing about visualizing data is it's you know it's much easier to understand, especially for visual learners. Um, and you can start with quantitative data first. So like in this case, um, they're documenting appointments by month, AV versus uh, print documents. They're looking at um, how many appointments were booked um, and, and actually people showed up um, over. And this, this is actually a monthly report that they do every year. So um, you can kind of see this over time as well. And then they also are tracking walk-ins by month um, and total appointments. So this is wonderful, wonderful proof for um, annual reporting to administrators the state library, um, final grant reports, informing maybe department decisions as well, staffing decisions. Um, this is just a wonderful tool to use. And then qualitative data. Um, this is like a little, this is uh, not, this is more just about kind of the senses and feelings and kind of personal impact that the memory lab has um, individually and then also as a community as a whole, which you know is very individualized depending on your community and who you're trying to reach. And there are different ways of gathering this kind of data. Um, I think an exit survey is a wonderful way to do it um, as people are leaving the lab. Um, I have a link here for the DC Public Library's example. Um, and Linda had talked about some of those questions to ask too, which we'll get into in a little bit again. Um, and then also if people are willing to, to speak to you individually, um, maybe you could have on the survey form, would you be willing to speak to staff um, independently, individually, um, maybe like by phone or something like that, that could be helpful to gather more information and. Um, make sure that you know you are connecting with uh, 
people, the community members that you want to connect with and that you are serving their needs. Um, so, and of course, it's wonderful to have just that extra uh, encouragement <laughs> too. Um, should be encouraging to get feedback. Um, then also thinking about um, your online resources. How do you gather that kind of data? Um, you could have like a little pop-up survey. I know those are kind of annoying sometimes when you're online and they pop up and they want you to know how you're experiencing the website. Um, but you know that does work, it can work. Um, you could consider doing that. And then for classes and events, for programs, um, the Memory Lab Network has a survey template to use. It's very, very, very brief. Um, and it's based on the Public Library Association's Project Outcomes, which is a free online resource. Um, basically keeping it as, as brief as possible, I think is, is the key. Um, and it also kind of alludes to um, the, the questions that we set up at the very beginning of the presentation. Just, um, you know, I feel knowledgeable, I feel confident, I intend to apply what I've learned, you know, those kinds of questions. Um, and going back to these different methods of collecting data, you might want to mix and match parts of these surveys um, into kind of one collective survey. Um, it's really up to you how you want to, um, or really how you, how you intend to connect with your, your community and, and um, kind of justify the existence of your lab. So it's, it's, it's customizable, of course, um, and maybe it feels a little bit overwhelming to have to do all these different types of evaluations and surveys. I mean, you could really just do one and kind of hit a lot of these um, metrics of just kind of trying to get a sense of the numbers and where people are coming from and then what is the overall impact and what are they taking away from the experience. So these are just some questions and I think Linda's already talked about some of some of these already but this is a kind of a combination of um, quantitative and qualitative. Um, and there, again, there's templates available. So you could start off um, asking people, where are they coming from? What field are you in? How are you connected with the library? How are you involved with the library? Um, I think this might be particularly interesting for um, reaching new communities that maybe your libraries, you know, um, has it connected with yet and getting a sense of um, what, why are they coming to the lab? Um, how does being at the lab make you feel? So this is more kind of, this is more getting into like qualitative, qualitative experience of the lab. Um, and what have you, what have you learned? Um, or have you used what you've learned from the class in real life? Like how applicable is it? Um, in your own words, what has the memory lab enabled you to do? Um, if the memory lab didn't exist, what would be different for you or for your community? Prior to using the lab, had you looked for equipment on doing this kind of work? What did you find? Can you describe this experience? So just kind of digging into kind of what brings people to the lab and what are they taking away from it? And of course, recognizing maybe what, what is the lab not providing or because this could feed into new programs, new initiatives um, based on what your community wants. And of course, we want to emphasize the success um, and you know, it's important to communicate um, the impact and you know, just not just for the staff, but uh, community and then for specific stakeholders too. And this really demonstrates the importance of, of providing this service within the community. Um, and then of course builds support for continued library funding. This validates your good work, which is very, very important. Um, so the very end, asking overall your users and um, your staff too, um, how did you first find out about the lab? How does it um, 
do you feel that it's helpful to preserving local history? What's the importance? How would you describe it to someone who's never seen it before? And then of course, is there anything else that you'd like to discuss? Um, I think this, a lot of this, so a lot of, most of these questions were adapted from this toolkit that, that came out of this webinar from the Community Archives Lab based at UCLA about um, assessing the impact of community archives. Um, memory labs are very closely linked with community archives and that we are trying to empower individuals, community members to identify what's most important to them, what they want to collect, what they want to digitize, what they want to share. Um, and it really is focused on active participation and autonomy of these community members, because we want them to feel like this is their, they own this process. They're learning how to do it on their own too. So it's, um, it's important to know that, to feel out if they are comfortable and what is their initial response and how do they feel after experiencing the lab? Is there anything else the library could do to support, to support them um, if, if, they don't, if they do feel unsupported? Um, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to this, Linda, about the user experience. Um, one of the things that occurred to me the other day was um, I was talking to a library that was really unsure about um, what the response was going to be from the community in terms of coming in and learning how to use the equipment. They kind of felt that their this whole process, I mean, learning how to use this equipment can be a little intimidating. And it made me wonder about the relationship between libraries and their local history organizations with town in town, the genealogy organization organizations. If you can get, um, if you can develop a relationship with those, uh, with those um, kinds of groups, they're often looking for this kind of equipment, um, and so. If you know, they might have a small group of people who would be interested in coming in and learning how to use it. It might be a way to kind of get the word out and launch your first um, training and use of the equipment. Um, because again, I, I talk to a lot of genealogy groups, and many of them they don't have access to this kind of equipment, and they're not going to purchase it individuals are not going to purchase it themselves. So for libraries that are establishing memory labs, this is this will be a great resource for them. And they can do a lot of promotion for you and get people in the door so that um, your your memory labs getting use and exposure. That's a that's a good idea. Maybe adding that to the user survey, like what communities could benefit or who is there anyone who could benefit from this memory lab? like actually kind of asking specifically around outreach so that we have mm -hmm. that personal connection. I could see that being really helpful. We also had, uh, this has been a few years back and I don't remember which library it was, but we had a library that developed a program with between seniors and teens and teens were helping seniors learn how to use the equipment that the library did have for digitization. And I think developing some of those kinds of programs too will not only bring in those who um, have materials that need to be scanned, but also developing relationships with those teens um, and getting them into the library and using that equipment and getting the word out as well. Great idea. Well, this is concludes our <laughs> presentation. I, but I, I do feel like it's kind of an ongoing discussion, though, around kind of understanding um, kind of the different different kinds of data that you're you're trying to pull out. Um, from your community. I think that's just kind of a lingering challenge is um, knowing what questions to ask of your community and to kind of tease out what their needs are. And this actually came up in the very, very first webinar of this series when we talked about um, planning the lab and trying to know kind of what your community 
needs, like what are the questions to ask even at that step? Um, and someone actually asked, what, what questions do you ask? And I know that's, that, that's still like out, that's still a resource that people need. So um, I think it would be great for us to, to work on that. And um, it, I think those questions could be a reflection of some of these initial um, questions we ask users at the lab. Um, because I think there is there is a, a question of like, yeah, do people want this resource and why? Um, and what exactly are they looking for when they come to the lab? Does anyone have any questions or comments? I did want to mention that um, for those of you maybe that have had uh, have already scheduled and held say online trainings or done something for staff and you didn't quite get to the required surveys for the grant um, reach out to um, your project advisor for um, one of you, I'm your project advisor, and I believe for Orange County, Loretta is probably your project advisor. But reach out and let us know because there could be, uh, we have a little bit of time and we can find ways to collect that data and get it entered so that you really will have some survey, some survey data. I don't want you to be, um, I don't want you to feel like, oh my gosh, we completely dropped the ball and now you know, there's going to be nothing. There, there are ways that if you have done some of this programming or presentations that we can collect some of that data and um, give you something electronic that you'll be able to input into that um, final, uh, final evaluation form. So don't, don't hesitate to reach out and tell us what's going on. We'll help you. That's what we're here for. And the final narrative report that there's a lot of space there for reflection, right? <laughs> yes, there is. Yeah, and for Constance, uh, for the program that you you all are doing today, I'm, somebody's probably already thought of this, but if you can capture photographs or in some way document that activity, that would be great. Yeah, we'll Again, work on that. Great, it, it helps. It helps the state library, of course. We want to see those things. And there's been a lot more emphasis on that in the last couple of years. But it's also, it's great for the library because you can use it for your promotional materials um, and as a way to help um, pull in additional resources for your program. Well, are there any other comments or questions? We have about five to seven more minutes. Um, this is our contact information, which you all probably already know. But yes, please reach out if you have any additional questions or, or comments um, around the evaluation step. Um, and we do look forward to, to hearing how things go, um, especially this, yeah, this last, I know this last month is hectic, um, but we are gonna look at the toolkit and refine it based on, based on your feedback and your evaluations. So, so thank you for, for investing all this time and I know it's it's hard sometimes to carve out that time to reflect when you're just going, 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 but it is really important to learn from the experience. But thank, thank you so much for coming and thank you, Linda, so much for your sage wisdom. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> um, I, I did want to let you all know that there is a 
um, Slack for the Memory Lab Network, which is just, you know, like a sophisticated kind of chat software, but you can also share documents and photos. And it's just, there's like lots of different threads happening around different topics. So if you all haven't gotten that invitation yet to join, um, you'll, you'll get it again. Um, it's just, instead of having like a listserv or kind of an email group, we're pointing folks to that Slack and California has its own channel so we can all hang out together there. Um, it really is a wonderful place to share resources. So I uh, just have to remind everybody about the, that great tool that's available. And I do hope to see you all in August at our next webinar. Um, it's gonna be with Edward Proctor and Todd Deck from Tehama County Library. They got an um, INLS grant uh, I think a couple years ago to open their memory lab. So we'll learn from them about sustaining and expanding the lab um, based on their experience so far. And then we also have a brown bag at the end of August, um, August 31st at noon. So I hope you all will join us then. And thank you so much for your time for tuning in today.